Okay, I'm here with uh, Chris Mathis. Uh, he is an attorney who lives here at LD9, Legislative District 9, where he's going to be seeking a seat in the Arizona House of Representatives. Um, he wants to be my representative, and so I wanted to sit down and give a have a talk with him and get to know him and uh, see what he's about. Uh, Chris, would you uh, give us a little bit of your background? Who is Chris Mathis? And importantly, for a lot of people who are going to know your wife, Colleen Mathis, uh, how did you come to catch her? Well, um, thank you very much for, for having me, Mike, for the opportunity. So, uh, as we were talking a little bit earlier, the, the most important decision that I've ever made was uh, to marry up. Oh, and uh, I, uh, I'm very fortunate to be married to Colin Mathis, who what was, uh, until recently, the, the chair of the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. So she was the chair last time around. Colleen and I were, uh, we dated in high school. We're both from Peoria, Illinois, originally. And I um, uh, had, uh, after that, had um, got married here in Tucson when we were living out on the East Coast and um, would come back and forth, planned our wedding here in Tucson at the Arizona Inn, and um, in the course of doing that wedding planning and traveling here and seeing how much more we liked it than where we were at the time, decided to move someday to Tucson. And we didn't know when that would be. We thought it might be after we retired, uh, and we got a chance to do it a few years after we got married. We got married in 1998, and we moved to Tucson in 2001, so we've been here now for for 20 years. So I am, as you mentioned, by by profession a lawyer, and I, the area in which I practice is elder law and estate planning. That's also something that my my dad did, and I have two lawyer brothers. As I was saying earlier, that seems to be in our family. That's uh, just about all we can do. We're <laughs> not that good at math. I got. I feel like I've gotten a little better the older I've gotten in math. We can't really sell stuff. And so, a lawyer is our best. Uh, is well, our you best also job. have some other professional qualifications you, that you picked up a little later in life, right? Yes. So, um, so I, I got got my law degree in my in my twenties, and then I had always been interested in government, public service, and so went back to school in my forties and was able to get a master's in public administration degree and a master's in public health degree. Out, uh, out east at uh, the first one from the Harvard Kennedy School and the second from the Harvard School of Public Health. Excellent. Now, what's your political background? Um, how long have you been involved in politics? Well, I've been involved in politics ever since I can remember. Uh, so um, when I was uh, three and four, my grandfather, who was a, a doctor, every once in a while, uh, it's, in our family, it's been it's been most mostly teachers, and then lately we've had sort of this spate of lawyers. But every once in a while, there's a doctor, and uh, he he was a, uh, most of the rest of us aren't really good at science. He was very good at that. In any case, he had had a, a career as a as a, a doctor as he was a urological surgeon back to where originally from in Peoria, Illinois, and he in 1972 decided to run for governor. And so, uh, so some of my earliest memories are of that campaign. As it turned out, he was running against an incumbent Republican governor. And uh, uh, so uh, my grandfather wound up losing that primary. But then after he lost the primary, he uh, teamed up with the Democratic candidate, who was a guy named Dan Walker. And um, that Democratic candidate actually wound up winning and beating Governor Oval. So, um, so, uh, so in any case, so that was the from from the from sort of my earliest memory. Uh, there was that, and then I think even before that, I remember watching political conventions on TV with my mom and dad. So I've just been interested in it for for a long time. And uh, so before I went to law school, while I was still in college, I worked uh, over the summer in the Illinois General Assembly for initially for Democratic staff as a page, and then in the Office of Legal Counsel there in Springfield. 
then a couple years later, I worked for the summer in the United States House of Representatives for the gentleman who was our representative from Peoria, who was a guy named Bob Michael, who at that point in time was the minority leader in the House of Representatives. So and a Republican. A, he was a Republican. And uh, sort of the last of the moderate Republicans, and he was the last Republican leader before New Gingrich. Well, that was, that was your family history, wasn't it? The moderate, moderate Republicanism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. essentially. Can, can you tell me what that what that meant to you at that time? I guess this is probably the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, it was kind of when I when I formed my, at least the initial political identity. And the thing is, it really hasn't changed that much. I think the parties have shifted so much. Um, but when I formed that, the Republicans, at least where we're from in, in Peoria, were quite moderate, and um, and so much of what the political discussion was about in Peoria at that time was trying to create a, a good, fair, equitable uh, environment for um, folks that worked at Caterpillar Tractor. And so you had there's uh, the, the UAW is a union, and you had folks who make all those uh, big uh, earth moving, uh, all that, all those big uh, earth moving, uh, pieces of earth moving equipment. And um, and then you also had people who were, um, maybe didn't work on the line, but worked there. And then you also had executives. And so, and, it, and growing up, we, we knew uh, folks who did all that, and kids that we played with, uh, had parents that did all that, and you know, they, they, they worked a cat, and the, the people in the medical community, the people in the legal community, the people taught in the in schools, and all of the, so many of the other businesses around town, whether it was retail or whether it was a company that maybe had some sort of specialty part that Caterpillar bought, it was very dependent on the success of cat. And so back then, really, uh, certainly there were differences between what Part of the company you were affiliated with, but the the notion was that if Cat was doing well, all of Peoria was doing well. We're all so in this together. We're all in this like, together. You know, moderate Republicanism might be considered more focused on building strong communities and families. Right. I think I think that's that's exactly right, and that's certainly how we thought. And um, and this is in uh, again, I was little and you know in grade school, but I was interested in this stuff. And this is. So I the version. Sorry about that. Uh, so, how has Republicanism changed in your lifetime, and why did you become a Democrat? <laughs> well, I, I think. Um, uh, well, first of all, I, I think that, and, and certainly I have I have changed a bit. Uh, I think that the main change in in my own thinking is that after. Practicing law for 20 plus years now, and just observing life as an adult, I've realized that uh, I've realized the role that luck plays in all of our existences, yeah. and um, so that has made me much more. Uh, so that's made me much more appreciative of the importance of the role of government in creating a situation where we can have uh, equal opportunity, and equal access to opportunity, and equal access to health care, equal access to education. Uh, this stuff shouldn't depend on the zip code that you're born into. I don't think when I was growing up that I had I'm certain I didn't have as much of an appreciation for that as I do. Yeah, it does. I mean, life gives you wisdom. Life gives, else. life gives you wisdom, and as, as President Kennedy said, life is unfair. And, and we, one of the roles of government should be to try to um, ameliorate that, try to help with that. And so, um, so that's changed in my thinking. But you know, the rest of it, I don't think has, has changed too much. Again, I, back when I got involved in this stuff uh, and growing up, and family. Social issues just weren't really a part at all of the discussion, of the political discussion, yeah. I think. Well, when you say social issues, what you really mean is religious issues. I, yeah, I think, I think the issues that were um, 
came to the fore, for initially at least, I think in that 1980 election when Ronald Reagan was elected, and I think at that point the Republican Party really changed yeah. for good. So what role do you feel that religion and religious faith should play in politics and governance, if any? Well, uh, I think the uh, I think the founders had it had it right, and I think that all of us should be able. To, Colleen and I go to uh, we're Episcopalian, and uh, we go to church up here on the corner at St. Philip's, um, and that is uh, our the values that we um, share uh, with other folks who uh, happen to go to church up there are values that could manifest themselves in policy. But uh, I don't think that there should be a dir any direct uh, role of uh, the church in, in, in the, the, the public sphere. Um, and certainly not religious dogma. No, no, and I think, I think we've seen um, I think there was a reason why the founders were concerned about that. You know, again, the founders, there's a lot of discussion about the founders these days. And, you know, they, goodness, they certainly weren't perfect. And, yeah, they were, uh, they were official established churches in many right. of the colonies. Right, exactly. And, and that's, and, and you look at that history, and, and then the idea of trying to, trying to, to keep that stuff separate is, uh, seems like a really good idea. And, and that had been the, um, the, for a lot of, I think, the 20th century, that had been the approach that both parties had taken. And I think in 1980, they started to change. And there are folks who, who have a, a different view to mine. And, um, and I think increasingly, a lot of those folks are in, are in the Republican Party. And I think the Republican Party has, um, has changed and, and catered to people who have more of that view. And so what... Uh, what are your foundational ethical or moral commitments that you think are vitally important in your service to the community as a politician? Well, I think that um, I've spent, I've, I've been fortunate to spend a fair bit of time um, studying, working in, practicing as a lawyer and advocate uh, in, in for healthcare policy. And I think that one of the, the fundamental roles of government, and I think it goes even beyond that, I think one of the sort of fundamental rights that we have as, not just as, Amer as Americans, but as people, is uh, the right to good health care. And so that really informs a lot of my thinking. And so uh, I love health care policy. I've done a lot of work in that area. And I can't remember uh, if we talked about that yet, but um, in, uh, in, uh, after I worked in, uh, in my initial roles, in, in the uh, legislative roles, I, and after I went to law school, I worked as a healthcare legislative assistant for Chuck Hagel, who was the senator from Nebraska and then went on to become Secretary of Defense in the Obama administration. I was his healthcare legislative assistant, so I handled healthcare issues for him. Then later on, I was able to go back to school and got a, in addition to a master's in public administration degree, got a master's in public health degree. In between those two degrees, I did some work in healthcare policy out of where I got those other degrees at in the Boston area, at the, uh, in, in this case, at, at Harvard Medical School. You've been really fortunate in your career to be able to follow your interests. I have, and I've been, I've been, I, that's exactly right. And, you know, when I applied to work for Senator Hagel, I was, I probably would have taken whatever, uh, whatever role was, uh, was there. And he just happened to need somebody who uh, was going to do exactly what I was interested in doing. Yeah. And then uh, when, when we were out east, there happened to be a role that came up at, uh, in, doing this healthcare policy stuff, it was exactly what I was interested in doing. So I've been able to, to do a lot of work in that regard, and, um, and I teach a course currently over at the law school as a professor of practice in healthcare law and policy. And at the U of A, you mean that? At, yes, at the, at, the, uh, at the law school at the University of Arizona. And um, 
I teach actually two courses. I teach that course and then a course on aging in America, it's called. And so that ties into my, my law practice and also to my work with Senator Hagel doing staffing the Special Committee on Aging. Well, you certainly sound well qualified to, to be in the state legislature. Um, my question for you, I guess, is why haven't you run before now? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so, so you can probably you know, tell from my background, it's certainly something that I've, I've thought about a lot and considered. Um, I was sort of getting ready to um, think about doing it uh, about 10 years ago. And so I, and just to talk about kind of my, my partisan journey, uh, so I stayed, I worked for moderate Republicans and I continued to be a registered Republican. Uh, I found in, in 2004, uh, I was unable to vote for the Republican candidate for president. You might want to remind people who that was. That and was a, a fellow named George W. Bush. Uh, and uh, I, uh, for various reasons, I found I was unable to vote. For George W. Bush, um, still I wasn't quite ready to uh, cast a Democratic ballot at that time. So what I did is I, I did a write-in, and I wrote uh, in my old boss Chuck Hagel. And uh, after I did that, I wrote a note to Senator Hagel. I said, "Dear Senator Hagel, I just want to let you know I voted for you today for President of the United States." Did he respond? Senator Hagel is uh, an amazing guy. And uh, he did respond, and he is an inveterate note writer and thank you note writer. And so I got this handwritten response back, and it said, Dear Chris, thank you very much for my one vote for president. Chuck. <laughs> and so... Uh, so uh, I, was, I was sure I was going to say, why do you hate me so much? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was... Uh, maybe he may have maybe ran out of, uh, of note card. <laughs> But um, but in any case, so that was in 2004. Then in 2008, what I, what I realized was, I, I so I voted in the you know the way it works in Arizona. If you're still registered, if you're registered in a party, you can vote in the presidential primary. If you're independent, I don't I don't think you can. And um, so I in 2008 I got the Republican ballot, primary ballot for president, and I couldn't vote for anybody on the ballot. So. I think I went home and maybe even the next day became an independent because I just thought, you know, if I if I can't if I can't vote, there's no choice for this top office. It's really unlikely that uh, right. And so um, so I switched to an, to independent, and then um, I was kind of a bit I was excited about that, but I was frustrated because I was like, okay, this is great. Now what do we do? Because there's no. We found this out with 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 Colleen's. Situation. There's well, really, yeah, that's that's something I want to talk about. Was you know, Colleen was an independent too, so you okay. kind of joined your wife, right? I did, and yeah, Colleen has actually been an independent. She was also a, a Republican. She grew up in a, in a Republican family, and uh, she, she became an independent in the mid '90s. And so that was, I think, at that time we were living in Illinois, and so when we moved to Arizona, she registered as an independent and, and has been has been an independent ever since, and still now. Well, you're creeping up on 2010 now. We're calling well, was, uh, was appointed so, to the RSC. So, so let's talk about that. So in so in 2010, so as I said, I had this interest in healthcare policy, and back when I was working in the Senate, uh, the the person who had done the most work and had the most impact on healthcare policy in the second half of the 20th century was Ted Kennedy. With Senator Kennedy, and so we—I was fortunate enough to work on some legislation with Senator Kennedy's staff when, when I was there, that had to do with uh, genetic non-discrimination and genetic testing. And um, and their Senator Kennedy and their staff, if you were working on an issue that they were also had an interest in, whether you're you know Republican, Democrat, whatever, they were they were there. And um, so oh, those were the days. So I had a good. Good, very good experience working with those guys, and I always admired the Kennedy family and any kids. And um, so I watched on C-SPAN, I was watching Senator Kennedy's funeral at the time when he, uh, I think in 2010, passed away. And of course, he had been there um, uh, at, the, at the, the beginning of what the, the, the debate over what became the Affordable Care Act, and then passed away. And, um, and so that funeral was going on. And 
and so I watched that on C-SPAN, and there are all kinds of interesting aspects of that that they showed. But in the course of all that, and listening to commentary about it, there was discussion about what an impact he had had. Again, somebody else who wasn't, uh, a, you know, a perfect person. None of us is a perfect person. Um, but he had a tremendous impact on people's daily lives with his work in the healthcare sphere, with his work in education, with his work in uh, labor, labor laws. And um, so after watching that, and uh, I uh, was a big um, uh, Barack Obama fan, the, my brother, uh, I have again a couple of brothers who are lawyers and they're sort of also political lawyers. My, my brother had worked in the Illinois State Senate as an aide and was there when, uh, when Senator Obama was there, and uh, uh, state senator at the time, and so that was a fast rise. Yes, and so <laughs> so I was uh, very excited about all that, and uh, and of course voted for uh, voted very enthusiastically for um, for President Obama in 2008, and that was actually the last vote, presidential vote my dad was able to cast in his life was for President Obama in 2008. So your dad took the same journey. Oh, my mom and dad took the same turn. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so your whole family yeah. pretty much were yeah. squoze out of Republican. Yeah, yeah we, um, it's just, um, and, and again, I think I, I think that there was some evolution in our thinking, but I, I think mainly it was that, but mainly it was just that we felt the party had just, the Republican Party had shifted away from us. And um, so, uh, so I changed my, after watching all the, the Ted Kennedy funeral stuff, I said, you know, it's time. So I became a Democrat. And then, and the, the great thing about that was you can finally, there's a structure. And so you can get involved. And so I think literally that same day, I called a friend of ours in town who at that time was working for uh, Arizona List. And, uh, and I said, um, you know, Chip, for you gentlemen, drinks are on me. I'm so sorry, I forgot about those. Thank you so much, that's appreciated. I said, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you, have any idea as far as what opportunities there might be, but if you do, let me know, because I'd like to get involved. And she said, well, as a matter of fact, and, uh, she, and this, I think, is, is almost always the case. If you're somebody who's interested in getting involved in this stuff, there's pretty much always something for you to do. Yeah. And oftentimes, you can... You know, move up pretty quickly because it's just uh, there's, the campaigns always need help, and so at that time there was a vacancy for, to be the uh, treasurer in the campaign of our the woman who was our state rep at the time, Nancy M. Yeah. And so, so I had a meeting with with Nancy, and thought she was tremendous and exactly who should be in that role. And so I very enthusiastically became her treasurer. So. Did that for her 2010 campaign. Uh, unfortunately, she wound up losing in that 2010 wave. Or really, that was the Tea Party wave. Very close election, but she she lost. And so, but in the course of doing all that, I became an elected PC in what was then LD 26. Mm -hmm. And um, so I then went to the in early um, well, of course. We can't talk about this stuff without talking about what happened in Tucson in early January uh, of 2011. Yeah. Was the shooting, the Gifford shooting, uh, and, and and others. Um, and um, uh, a few weeks after that, the the state party conventions occurred. And so I went to the Democratic uh, state convention in up in Phoenix. Actually, my mom went with me. She was visiting at the time. That was fun for her. Um, and uh, and then uh, sort of going on at that same time, uh, Colleen, my wife, had put in an application back in the uh, I do not appear now that the time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> back in, uh, in August or September, I think, of that previous year, 2010, to be the independent chair of the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. So that was kind of, uh, that was kind of chugging along. And um, when she applied for that job, I told her that 
but she should realize that she could wind up getting it because yeah. I, you know, I know, uh, um, I, I know her skill set, and uh, I knew that she would. Uh, careful be what you ask for. I right? knew that she would be very competitive, and yeah, that's right. And um, and uh, and so so she did. And as soon as she, that's a longer story. <laughs> but as soon as yeah. she, I'll be talking to her later this week, yes. and uh, yes. we so might tell some of that story. Yeah, she's authoritative. Arizona. She's authoritative yeah. on these matters. Yeah. Um, but as soon as she got that job, uh, I think both of us realized what a very important role it is, and how being the independent chair, it is a nonpartisan. It's supposed to be. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is. It is supposed to be, and, and and that's how she viewed it. And she viewed the job as uh, you're not supposed to draw Democratic maps. You're not supposed to draw Republican maps. You're supposed to draw maps for at that point in time, 6.4 million citizens of Arizona, and respect the constitutional criteria, especially competitiveness. And she has become, I think, perhaps the uh, leading. Ambassador or evangelist for competitiveness on a national level since then, and as an independent, that is something that she values very highly. So, um, so once she got that job, it was not appropriate for me to have. And there's no constitutional prohibition or legal prohibition. It, we just didn't feel it was appropriate for me to have that role. So you thought I, it might undermine the the notion of the IRC and the role of the IRC for I, you to run for office. I did on those maps. I, well, I, I never it never occurred to me for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I it would uh, running for office on those maps would have been something that was just like, wouldn't have occurred to me because it just uh, there's a, there's a conflict there. Yeah. And, uh, well, yeah. at least the, the um, a possible appearance or accusation of yeah. Yeah. conflict. I, 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 but I, I find that to be refreshingly ethical and well, principled of you to, <laughs> well, to not even run under those. Well, patterns. it was. I, I definitely, I definitely viewed it that way. And um, and so uh, because of that, I basically sat out for for ten years and um, continued to. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Appreciate the support us. Continued to uh, think about all this stuff, and uh, and as we were saying earlier, got a couple of degrees uh, out east that have to do with uh, with, with public policy, and, um, uh, and tried to tried to support her, and and that that was important for and again it's a much longer discussion of what happened here ten years ago. We're coming up on the. Ten-year anniversary of her removal from at least temporary yeah. removal. Let's just, from let's just uh, summarize. She was very fairly untreated by the Republican majority, she, yes. and it took the intervention of the of the, of the court system to, to put that right. Yes, but for the uh, but for the court system, and when we talk about the court system, this was uh, this was a Arizona Supreme Court at the time that was as far as uh, there were. So back then, there were still well, there were still Democrats on that. Court. There, there was there were, there were two there were two Democrats yeah. and there, there were three Republicans. Back then, there used to be five. That's a whole other discussion that we could have. Uh, but um, but she was reinstated by that court unanimously, and that included two uh, appointees of Governor Brewer, who was the person who had removed with the consent of. The Arizona Senate, her Colleen from that role. So, um, so that that's a really important part of her story, which I hope she tells. Is uh, certainly there was Democratic support for for the commission, but there was also when it really mattered uh, a fair bit of that old-fashioned moderate Republican support that we talked about earlier. And more importantly, it was approved by the people of Arizona overwhelmingly. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a uh, that that proposition passed in, in 2000 with 56 percent of the vote. And so, um, so in any case, uh, she she uh, served in that role. I was happy to help in whatever way I could, and we really kind of became our mission to support the cause of independent redistricting, not just in Arizona but but nationally. And that's been a lot of fun. We've gotten to meet a lot of great folks who are also interested in that. And, and the movement has uh, notched up some notable success. It, it has. It has, and it's it's tricky. It doesn't. It's not. It's not perfect. It doesn't take politics out of the 
process. You can't do that. It's no, it just takes political. the politicians out of the process. Hopefully, <laughs> precisely speaking yeah. of conflicts, right? Yeah, exactly. And so couldn't get a bigger one. So, so that's um, and again, by the way, where we're from in Illinois, um, the Democrats yeah. are in control, and the maps, just these maps that, that just got drawn, um, are it's a it's about as uh, intense a democratic gerrymander as you could draw and it's the legislature still controls it in illinois and, and that's that's what happens and that's not uh, it's just both both parties do it equally and it's really a function of wanting to stay in power uh, by more than than anything else and so yeah i think there's a certainly an institutional incentive to yes. you know protect your interests right. when you're the, the, right. the majority in the legislature right. and, and you get to draw them Right, it's, pro it's probably human nature, yeah. and so, so if we can set up systems that, uh, that uh, the guard against that, it's it's a good idea. So, so yeah, that and now that this now that the Supreme Court has essentially said they're not going to do gerrymandering right. anymore, right, which is a whole other discussion. And uh, and, and Colleen had two cases that went to the United States Supreme Court. One which was decided by a five-four vote, and again on the margins there, it was Justice Kennedy uh, who. Probably was more in that old Republican model, who was the fifth vote, and uh, the second case they went in. In any case, so that role, that chairman chair's role, is a ten-year role. The bulk of the work is the first year or two, yeah. but it goes on for ten years, and so that was so it wasn't appropriate. To, we didn't feel to have any political role for ten years. So now it's time for you to step up and well. Yes, and so use your expertise to the benefit of Arizona. Well, I, 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 I yes. If there's if there's a way that I can do that, uh, and, um, I'd well, love to before we get into that a little bit, I, I want to know who is a current figure in politics. We talked about you know some of the people that you worked with coming up and growing up and yeah. that you admired, but who in current politics do you look to as a role model, somebody that you really admire and like to emulate? I think there are there are two that immediately come to mind. Uh, the, yes. the, I guess the first is no longer in the role, but we mentioned him earlier, President Obama. Uh, and uh, as far as people currently in office, President Biden. So when I worked in the Senate again for a Republican for Chuck Hagel, Senator Hagel worked very closely with then Senator Biden on the Foreign Relations Committee, mm -hmm. and those two. Became really good friends, and um, and I just think, to, to me, um, um, President Biden's career really exemplifies what it means to be a good public servant, servant. and it's to do to do the homework, uh, to fight for your beliefs when when it's appropriate to do so, but also to always be trying, if possible to build consensus, forge consensus, and be able to accomplish things that benefit people. And so yeah. to me, that's, you know, he really is an exemplar of that. And um, uh, I think someone who has done some of that work here actually is who I hadn't met until just recently, but is our current uh, LD9 state senator, Victoria Steele. And in talking to Senator Steele, she has done it, and of course she's been in the, in the minority in Phoenix, but she's done some really great work on some really tough and important issues uh, with respect to uh, criminal justice, with respect to women's rights, and uh, sometimes the only way that those things get accomplished was to essentially do the work, do the homework, and then hand it off to a willing Republican. Yeah, and she's done that a number of times and with great success. And so I think that really is an example to me. Great. So what do you think are the the biggest problems and challenges facing our democracy, both as a nation and here in Arizona? Um, I think that as far as the 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 big picture uh, democracy question, that uh, we're seeing a dramatic increase in efforts to curtail voting rights, to suppress voting rights. And again, this is something that the folks that I worked for and uh, the Republicans I was involved with back in the day, 
I, maybe I'm naive, but I don't think it ever entered their minds. I think it was quite the opposite. I think that um, there was this shared notion that the more people that you can get into the system, the better, yeah. and that the idea is to try to appeal to the most people, and that's how you win elections. And it's this sort of, you know, politics is about addition, not subtraction. And that just sort of seemed to me to be true and just axiomatic. And I, I think there's a, a, a large, a, unfortunately, I think a growing contingent that doesn't necessarily feel that way. And I think feels that the way to win elections is to um, try to divide and to try to shave off votes that wouldn't uh, go in their in their direction, and that just to me is completely counter to what the state of Arizona is all about, what the United States of America is all about. So I just can't. That's something that needs to be fought at every turn, and I'm afraid that that's something that, in terms of this next session. Um, in terms of this this appointment that is current, currently pending, and as we talked, I'm, I'm in the running for the appointment, but I'm also running in the intended in running fall, regardless of whether you're appointed. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and uh, but I but I think that whoever gets that appointment is going to have to be really up to speed and to hit the ground, you know, sprinting to do everything possible to combat uh, this all of these different voter suppression bills that they they tried. Last time around, some of them uh, passed, some of them failed. The idea that one of the things that Connie and I were struck by when we got to Arizona is how easy it was to vote. And uh, it's the way it should be. Mail-in voting and all this. And, um, and, 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 and just as with independent redistricting, Arizona has really been a national model in and having this this permanent early voters list, voting yeah. list, and yeah. um, and and there's not a problem with it. And frankly, Republicans have benefited just the same as Democrats have benefited mm -hmm. from it. And the idea that so there's no not only is there not a problem, but we're a national model that you would try to um, wreck that, mess with that, yeah. uh, and, and and successfully, unfortunately, the last session is just I, I can't kind of unfathomable. In any case, but there were another a uh, bunch of other bills that didn't pass. But they're coming right back, and so I think that one is is a uh, alarming one, and not just for uh, the state for voting in the state, voting practice in the state, but for our democracy writ large. Yeah. The other one that is the most imminent threat is the threat to reproductive rights, and that is uh, we see this this law in Texas that is um, uh, just sort of a. It's insane. I never it, thought I'd see anything like this in my lifetime. The, right. I mean, it's just flat out an unconstitutional taking of, of Texas women's right. Rights. It's it's clearly uh, takes away a constitutional yeah right yeah and 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 it's and, and it's so that is so clear and 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 even on the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice saw that and wanted to uh, stop the thing in its tracks. And it's just sort of kind of amazing that we're in a situation where you could pass a law like that, which is really designed to uh, flummox judicial review yeah. and and fall for it, yeah. and let that thing go into uh, let that thing go into effect. Yeah, and it's, and it's when you travel, when you, and, um, and I, 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 the um, the idea. So there's sort of like the. The procedural aspect, of it. and then when you look at what the functionally what it's doing, and it is basically taking away uh, almost 50 years of constitutional yeah. jurisprudence. It's legal terrorism against the against the women of Texas. That's what it is, right? And yeah. and so you're essentially just I mean you're it, it's 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 um, stopping. Uh, Abortion and, and, and completely. Yeah. Um, uh, and I absolutely know the Arizona legislature is planning on doing something. That's exactly something. right. And so that's something that after the first of the year, um, and that's the problem. Well, I mean, that's one of the problems. 
was the fact that the Supreme Court didn't stop this thing because now all of the Republican legislatures in the country, green light. Yep. this bill is going to come. And, and this is probably a bill that is, is something you know, I think Senator Ducey or Governor Ducey will, uh, may well sign. Yeah. Let's say that Governor Ducey uh, wouldn't have an opportunity to sign it or for whatever reason wouldn't sign it. And let's say that the election goes in a way that we certainly wouldn't want it to go next year. Somebody like Carrie Lake would sign this. And I think what she has said is she'd sign it, quote unquote, heartbeat. in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's what that's what we're doing. And so um, so I think those those two things, voting rights and uh, and reproductive rights are are imminent threats and imminent concerns. Um, the other two issues that uh, are uh, near and dear to my heart are, uh, well, the other three issues are, um, as we were talking earlier, healthcare, and just doing everything that we can do to build on the Affordable Care Act, expand access to healthcare. I think we're really, I just saw a story the past couple of days about how uh, Arizonans uh, are the number of Arizonans covered under the Affordable Care Act plans mm -hmm. has uh, exchange plans has uh, had a great uh, percentage increase in the past year. And why is that? Well, it's because now you've got, speaking of uh, the, our current president, you've got a, an administration in place that actually supports the Affordable Care Act, which is the law yeah. in the United States, by yeah. the way. And uh, just doing all the things that were originally envisioned, and some in addition to that, when the law was passed 10 years ago. So um, that's key. The other thing is just as I've been reading about kind of where things stand in Arizona and all of this, I still can't quite believe that even with all of the progress that was made with uh, red, the Red for Ed movement, again, the national model, yeah. successful national model, Arizona still is 50th in teacher pay, and not quite so bad, but 49th in overall education spending. Yeah, and and it's just that is not acceptable, period. And so that needs to that needs to change. That needs to change. And again, it's it's amazing to me that this is a partisan issue. Uh, going back to growing up and going to public schools and going to a uh, land grant college, and uh, just the idea that this is a partisan issue um, uh, clearly is. But uh, it's just it's kind of we've part. learned a little something over the past hundred years about how to make a you know a healthy, prosperous, you know strong society, right. and you know education and healthcare are key parts right. of that. Right, exactly, and and it's just something just in my own family, our uh, story arc and our journey would never have been possible without public education and land grant universities. And I mean, it's just, no, grab that I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't signed it yet. You're all good. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's just uh, something that is a, a core aspect of what makes the United States the United States. And, um, and it's just hard for me to believe anybody would want to tear it down. Thank you, sir. Um, or not just not not just anybody want to tear it down, right. but anybody that anybody wouldn't want uh, our, the state of Arizona to be as good and as strong as possible with respect to a public education system. Yeah, um, and it's not just the elementary education. I mean, we we have basically stopped funding our our universities. Right, and of course, then there's an issue there with uh, tuition uh, inflation, and, and that tariff? leads to an issue with the student debt crisis and so it just sort of it all snowballs and uh, uh, so there's that but then uh, speaking of snowballs um, we have the climate crisis to deal with and just in the news the past couple weeks you're seeing the uh, we've got uh, Lake Mead and Lake Powell are uh, down to something like 33 percent of, of where they ideal we ideally would be because of that there's issues with um, our cap allocation, and that leads to issues with groundwater. This is something in southern Arizona. We're actually in better shape than elsewhere in the state because of something we have thought about more, but we're in the same boat as well. And so um, all of the water issues are have to be top of mind, and, uh, and then that leads to broader climate 
crisis issues. And of course, the other thing about this, all this stuff, is there's such opportunity here. And there's such an opportunity for the clean energy economy and green jobs. And I think all of us, whether you moved to Arizona or you're born here, wonder why isn't there more solar going on? And, you know, why don't we have more incentives in the system to take advantage of these opportunities? And so that's something that I'd love to to work on if I uh, were able to get up to Phoenix. So I think those, and I, no doubt there are more, but I think those those five issue areas are are key. So do you have any idea of uh, the committee assignments and work that you'd like to do? I think that certainly one would be. Uh, Healthcare, just because I think that's something that I have some 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 expertise in and would love to to help with that. The other one I mean I really am passionate about is education, and um, I'm a, a proud Arizona Education Association member, and um, I just I and I think it's all so important. I think that every piece of it is key, and so I would love to be able to be be a part of that because I you know I. I I benefited so much from a strong public education system. Yeah, and uh, and I think our country has, and I just I, you know, I think we all need to fight for it. Yeah. Taking a step back, I mean, thinking about the the job that you want as a representative for LD nine to the Arizona House, what does that job entail? to you in terms of your duties and obligations toward the voters? I think that the main role of a representative is to represent the district. And uh, that doesn't mean to represent only the folks that voted for you. It's to represent all the district. And of course, we don't know exactly what that district is going to look like. like. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but there's no doubt that whatever shape it takes, uh, there's going to be Democrats, but there's also going to be plenty of Republicans, and there's going to be plenty of folks that, that, that aren't going to share my views, but there'll also be plenty of disaffected Republicans, and there's plenty of independents. Uh, I have, uh, I, I may have an advantage in, um, in working with these folks because I've been both. I've been a disaffected Republican. I've been an independent. Of course, my wife is an independent. And so um, I really think that's the job. And I've, I've been so lucky that when I worked in the United States House of Representatives, all the jobs I've had in, in, in government, the House, the Senate, uh, Parliament, and the uh, Illinois General Assembly, I worked for folks that really viewed uh, that as the job. They viewed representing everybody in the district. They also view constituent service as a key component of the job. There's a bit less of that in the state legislature than there would be in a congressional office, but that is that is really the role that you have. Um, I think from a policy perspective, your job is to fight as hard as you can for your beliefs. Uh, and uh, But I also think that uh, a big part of the job is to try to seek consensus whenever possible. Not to compromise your principles, but to try to find consensus. I think that it's likely, however the maps get drawn, that at least in the beginning of this 10-year cycle, that Democrats will be, at least by a seat or two, in the minority. We'll see what happens, but I think that that would be my guess. And uh, so it's really going to be necessary for whoever's up there to do both those things, to fight the bad stuff, but also to seek opportunities to... Uh, do good stuff, and just yeah. to, to and, and to build relationships, mm -hmm. to build relationships, and that's something else that the folks that I've worked for were very good at doing, and they worked very hard at it. Um, not just relationships with the other members, but relationships within the district, mm -hmm. and try to build a broad coalition and to listen to people. And I think that's a really key aspect. And when I was a legislative assistant in the Senate, that was a big part of my job was meeting with. Folks, uh, you know, sometimes uh, meet with uh, ten or twelve groups a day, and uh, there are long days. But it was really important to ha to put in the time and to listen to the concerns and to try to figure out a way uh, to help if you could. And so that's what I'd like to do. What would you like to be if you were elected? 
uh, and you spent at least two years in the in the legislature. What you, what would you like to be your signature accomplishment, your legacy, in in that role? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, if if between the time I got started and the time I finished, we had made significant gains in both teacher pay and education funding in the state of Arizona, I would feel like that had been a really important accomplishment. Time well spent. Um, and uh, and along those lines, uh, if 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 when you sort of look at where you where you began and 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 where you stopped, if we could have better, uh, more expanded health care access for Arizonans, if we built on the Affordable Care Act in every way possible, if we've taken advantage of every federal uh, opportunity that we have, um, I think that would, be, that would be key. If we've uh, managed to fight back all of this stuff that's going on right now with respect to voting rights and we've been able to restore um, the uh, uh, permanent early voting to where it was back when everything was working fine and there was no problem with it just last year. <laughs> yeah, um, That would be great. I think um, something else I would like to do and I think is, uh, is key and I think this needs to happen in every state in the United States. I also think this needs to happen federally is we need to pass uh, there's legislation right now that essentially codifies Roe versus Wade mm -hmm. because the environment that we're in right now, we don't know. Uh, Roe, the, Roe versus Wade seems to be in peril, whether it's getting chipped at or whether there'll just be a wholesale overturning of it. The first is probably the most likely, you know, at least immediately. But as we've just been discussing, this Texas law basically functionally overturns it. So I think uh, Congress needs to pass uh, the. Uh, National Women's Health Protection Act, and I think each state needs to pass the same thing, and Arizona should do the same thing. So we should codify what has been the our the the, uh, the law that uh, we've all come to know over the past fifty years. And so many, I, I haven't looked at the numbers, but I would guess that perhaps even the majority of the population right now has never known. A, an environment where we didn't have those protections. So yeah. I think that's crucial. That's true. Absolutely. Um, uh, what do you think uh, uh, of the, the role of direct democracy in, in Arizona, especially the, uh, the initiative process, the referendum process? Do you think that's been a net positive for Arizona? And what might you be able to do and accomplish through that process as a legislature that you couldn't get through? Necessarily through the legislature. Um, it's a great question. I think that it's such an opportunity. And again, this isn't this isn't in Illinois, uh, where we're originally, Kelly and I originally from. We don't have the anywhere near the same ability. There's some ability. We don't have this ability to have citizens' initiatives. And as we were talking earlier. That's where the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission came from. Um, I think that there are uh, a couple, uh, at least, of kind of systemic good government reforms that I'd love to see. And, and these really flow out of our experience uh, with, um, with the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. I think one thing that would be an improvement is would be to expand that commission. Now there's there are five members. There are two Republican appointees, two Democratic appointees, and one independent chair. When 20 years ago, when that legislation, or when the initiative was passed, uh, that kind of reflected the makeup of the voters in the state of Arizona. Now it's roughly a third, a third, a third. Yeah, and so. The commission, in any case, should be to reflect that. And so I think three Republicans, three Democrats, and three independents. I think another thing that would do is it would take some of the pressure off, uh, which we, of which we are keenly aware, of the independent chair. Because right Always now. Always being the deciding vote. Yeah, right. That role is pivotal. I think in Colleen's case, folks thought, well, we may not like these maps. Here's what we do. Let's, let's knock the independent chair out and try again. 
fortunately that wasn't successful. But I think it's just it, it, it's just a uh, there's a temptation to do that. And so that's a reform that I would would love to see. Another one which is linked to that, but also gets to my my law practice work, is I think that we need to do something to insulate the Commission on Appellate Court appointments from from politics. Um, it. Can we change the acronym while we're at it? CACA? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um yeah, there's probably a way to um, to get something that's uh, that's a little bit better on right. that. Uh, most people are probably aren't familiar with this body. What what is that? And well, why are you concerned about it? <laughs> well, yes, it, I mean it's kind of an arcane thing, but it's really an important thing. And so so there's this body, the Commission on Appellate Court Appointments, and it's essentially the vetting body for uh, folks who get uh, Become judges on appellate courts in Arizona. Another uh, another um, vetting function that it has is to vet the candidates for the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission, the, mm -hmm. the, the folks who have put thrown their hat in there for that. And um, over the course of the past number of years, um, since we've had um, there's been one party in power in. The executive branch on the ninth floor since 2009, and we, the way that that legis the way that the law currently stands, the language is a little soft as far as achieving partisan balance, and also as far as the amount of time that the governor has to the governor does these appointments that the governor has to replace vacant seats on yeah. that body. Yeah. And so that combination of being able to essentially stack it with members of one party, in this case it's Republicans. Again, if this was, if this was in Illinois, it would be the, the exact opposite. This thing would be stacked with Democrats. Uh, but it's really a function of the legislative language, I think. The other thing that I think has happened is that they've been able to sort of slow walk um, filling vacancies. And so we're actually just just looking at some legislative uh, reform legislation in the past couple of days that would try to um, improve this via the initiative process. So I think those are those are two things. There are other things that I'm very interested in. Uh, um, the, I think one of the issues that we have in Arizona right now is um, there's a, and again, this is something I think Democrats have to realize as well as Republicans. Uh, our primary system is such that I think we should take a hard look at different approaches. California has this top two approach that they do. Another approach that is an interesting one is top five. And this is this notion where you would alter the current primary dynamic by allowing a certain number of folks, regardless of their partisan affiliation, to move on from the primary to the general election. And I think that's a really interesting reform. I've, I've, I've heard some uh, a critique of it if you do top two, because if you do top two uh, in districts that are dominated by Republicans, the concern is you'll just get two Republicans. There'll be no Democrat on the ballot in November. The other way around, if you have districts dominated by Democrats. Top five, I think, solves that a bit. Uh, I'm not sure the parties, or either one of them, is, are real excited about that reform, but I think it's an interesting one to take a look at. Yeah, I'd recommend that you look at, you know, outside the single member district model because, yeah. you know, I mean, the problem with that is, you know, 51% of the vote uh, goes to electing the, the leadership for that district and 49% of the people right. are left in the cold. Right, yeah, yeah, and that's, uh, and that's another, and just having a more um, representational form of representation. Yeah, uh, which gets which is a little, little bit more like other other democracies. You know. That's an interesting one. Um, another one is ranked choice, yeah. which has been done. Um, you know, again, nothing's perfect, but I think but that we could get more perfect. I think we, we could get closer. I think we could get closer, and I, I think that if, if I think um, but yeah, voting theorists will tell you there is no perfect way to, uh, to right. elect representation. Right. Well, and I think that's a really important point. Is that something that comes out of uh, looking at healthcare policy for for all these years is that you never get to the point where you're done. Like you, yeah. you never sort of build the perfect system. Yeah. Uh, there's always gonna be something that you can do and there's always gonna be 
uh, like with Medicare, there's always going to be somebody's always going to be able to figure out how to game the system. So there will always be a need to go in and reform. That doesn't mean you fail. That's just the nature of of these things. It's the nature of the systems. But we got to keep trying. We got to keep trying to figure out how can we make things better uh, in all these fronts. Can you tell us a joke? <laughs> um, uh, I uh, I need to consult my staff on that. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. <laughs> all right. Well, I want to thank you for joining us here today, and uh, it was a great conversation. I, I hope you uh, hope you uh, educated the public about what you stand for and what you think and what your philosophy is. Because that's that's the point of this series is to to get to know the person who's going to be hopefully representing us better and what their their ideas, uh, their motivations, and their ethical commitments, and their background is. Because we've learned, uh, I think, in these last couple of years, how very, very, very important the character of a leader is uh, and what their true beliefs are. So I want to thank you for uh, coming on here and you know not having a script or any idea of what I was going to ask and just you know letting me ask what I want to ask and have a conversation with me. Thank you very much, Mike. Really thank you for joining us. Us.